Nice move to go to the net. Clark shot scores! Oh my, what a goal Carson Lambos. Now Raddy keys it up, goes back door, scores! You're listening to Dauber's Draftcast with Tony Ferrari and the Dauber Prospect Scouting Team, powered by Instat Hockey. All right, welcome into this episode of Dauber's Draftcast. As always, I am your favorite ball draft analyst, Tony Ferrari, and joining me today is Nick Richard, also of Dauber Prospects and TLN. So how, how's it going today, Nick? Good, despite the Leafs not being able to pull out a win last night. A nice Sunday morning. I mean, that's what that's what good goaltending gets you, right? <laughs> Solid goaltending all around for the Leafs. But uh, we'll get into that later on and when we're talking privately. But today we're, we're going to break down some of the difference between my ranking and the team's ranking over at Dauber Prospects. But uh, before that, let's get into some of the news and notes. Um, big thing that happened the last couple of weeks, we didn't really get to it on the last episode because it was the uh, rankings meeting episode. So didn't really want to shove any uh, extra news and notes in there because it was already a long one, but <laughs> the draft lottery rules have changed. So I'll just quickly go over what they are, what the changes are, and then uh, get your take on the Nick. So teams will be limited to no more than two lottery wins over a five-year period. Teams will only be allowed to jump up 10 spots in the lottery and the reduction in a number of team and the number of picks decided by the lottery will go from three to two. Um, this won't come into play until 2022. And one of the other interesting things that I thought was that I, I kind of came across was Thomas Durant from The Athletic said that uh, sources are suggesting to me that they're, the two and five rule for the NHL draft lottery change would only function so that teams can only move up in the draft order twice in five years. So if a team has the worst record and two other teams higher up still win it, for, they can still pick number one and two over and over and over again. So essentially that means this isn't necessarily the Connor McDavid, Taylor Hall, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Neil Yakupov rule. It's more the Capo Caco uh, Lafreniere rule where the Rangers jumped up 12 spots, I think for Capo Caco and, and similarly for Alexi Lafreniere. So this isn't necessarily Det- paying off Detroit and saying, Hey guys, just cause you won two shitty lotteries doesn't mean you can win uh, Shane, Wright. I mean, that's not Detroit's case, but it's not that situation where you're limited. So what, what was your take when you first seen the new lottery rules, Nick? I think it's just kind of speaks to the NHL still trying to strike that balance between, you know, discouraging tanking and still kind of rewarding the, the worst teams in the league by helping them inject some of that high end talent. I don't think that the league wants to encourage teams to tank like we see in the NFL. <laughs> the the draft is strictly determined by standings there's no lottery or anything like that so I, I think it's a kind of a slippery slope if, if the NHL does just go that route and have it so it's just standings based so I, I like the changes to the lottery uh yeah it's one of those things where I looked at it and I was like initially I was just like why why yeah. like you're they're always tweaking it every 18 months it seems they're tweaking it um the one rule I didn't really like at first was that that uh, two and five rule where they limited teams because like generally speaking, if you're in lottery, say four, four, four straight years, um, you're probably not going to have the same GM. Those last two lotteries. Let's be honest. If, if, yeah. if you've got a first overall pick a couple years in a row or a top two pick a couple years in a row and you're not doing much with it, your GM is probably out of the door. That means the new GM needs those, those assets because maybe the previous GM messed up on those first two picks. Um, so I do like that little addition that, that Thomas Trance had kind of said where, um, it's more about limiting the fact that the Rangers or the Leafs just missed the playoffs and they jump up. Um, it, it's yeah, you can only get up so high now, so you're not going to see the 13th yeah. or 14th worst team getting all the way to first overall anymore. And I think that's kind of what they were trying to mitigate. Yeah, exactly. So if the Rangers were to win the lottery and they were the 13th ranked team, the highest they could go is 10. That means the top two teams, which last year were Detroit and Ottawa, was it would have got those picks rather than Detroit end up picking fourth and Ottawa's actual pick because it was San Jose's that won the third pick. So Ottawa's actual pick was fifth. So it, that kind of sucks for those two teams who, like, especially in Detroit's case, were just bad. It wasn't even that they tanked. They were just yeah. terrible with terrible contracts. So it's a good change, I think. I, again, there is an element of, like, just why are we continuously making changes to this this plan? But the, the NHL wants to run the lottery, so it, it is what it is with the changes. But uh, with that, one of the interesting things that I thought ha- came out was Darren Dreger tweeted out with the fact that all these new lottery changes are coming out and the, the draft stuff is kind of starting to leak out and we're not getting a move draft date. That's a kind of a big deal. So we're, we're probably going to be sticking with July 23rd and 24th. What was your kind of initial reaction on just the fact that we're having the, the draft this summer? 
thankful. <laughs> yeah. For, um, I, much like you, I always thought it was kind of silly to even be considering pushing it a whole year. Uh, not only is it not fair to a lot of these kids that have worked towards this point in their hockey careers already to be drafted in the year that they normally expected to be. Um, yeah, it's just, just glad that they're going to not disrupt the entire hockey calendar and disrupt the entire cycle of drafts and try to have two at once next off season or something like that. I mean, we've talked about this in private plenty, but if we're able to try and scout these kids and watch as much film as possible and, and put these lists together while we have children at home and regular day jobs <laughs> and we aren't making big yearly salaries doing this, I don't see any reason why NHL organizations can't do it. <laughs> Mind you, the stakes are much higher for those people and it is their jobs on the line and those are big investments you're making with those draft picks on, on young players that maybe you didn't get to see as much as you would in a normal year. But everybody has had to adjust through this whole pandemic for the last year or more now. And this is just another adjustment that NHL teams have to make. Do your video work and compile the best list you possibly can going into the summer and just draft. <laughs> yeah, like the, the way I've looked at it is like, everyone's doing the work like you said everyone's kind of in the same boat and and this could be an advantage for teams that are willing to invest heavily in video scouting this could be an advantage for teams who are willing to actually get things going and, and w one of the interesting things i found when i was reaching out to a few nhl scouts that i know is that this seems like it was a very gm driven initiative in in the first place uh, the gms wanted it there and, and i think what you touched on there where it's a much higher stakes thing for them than it is us is a big factor in that because you look at a lot of scouting staffs and there's scouts from two or three regimes prior that are still sitting there with the teams. And I mean, you look at Buffalo scouting staff as limited as it is. A lot of those guys have been there for two or three GMs now. So it's one of those things where I think the GMs are like, Hey, this is my job on the line because if I mess up the pick, I'm the one that kind of gets blamed for it. Despite the fact that let's be honest, like the, the, the NHL scouts are the ones that are doing the work and putting in the time and, and doing everything for the, for the draft. So it was always interesting to me because every time I talked to a scout, like even when it first came out uh, a couple months ago where Dreger, I think on insider trading was like, Hey, maybe they're moving the draft back. And in, in it, right away, um, I reached out to a couple of people and they were like, and eh, some GMs want it. It's not really a scout thing. Scouts are doing the work. Scouts are still doing the, the video watching because what else are they going to do? Like they, they can't just stop working for a year. And, and I think that was kind of the, the essence of it is they wanted to essentially push the draft back to next year and, and pile up double the work on the scouts. Because like I said, the GMs aren't the ones doing the scouting work on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course they know the first rounders, second rounders, and maybe even thirds. But when you, when you're getting to pick two fifteen or something like that, your GM's not going to be like, Oh, well, I know exactly the player I want to pick here. Cause <laughs> yeah. he's never watched those guys. So it, it's an interesting thing. But one of the things that, I, that did come up was uh, Darren Dreger suggested a, a showcase event. Um, it was really interesting because I think it was myself and Will Scout a few weeks back who suggested I think they I, did it. I, I think I suggested it to you one time in the Slack chat. Yeah, you may have done that. <laughs> was, but this is the thing, like, I think you, uh, we've talked about it in our Slack chat a bunch. Um, myself and Will Scout talked about it in his Discord channel and stuff. And it, it was one of those things where, like, almost everyone I talked to seemed like, this was a really basic idea that you could put together yeah. some sort of showcase event. Um, Will and I went crazy with it, wanted to do it like NFL combine style, like yeah. it's all crazy. And like, you could do it. You could market it. You could get something going for the NHL where they could get some money. And um, if, if you want to listen to that episode where we kind of dove into it more, it was uh, the episode 24 from February 23rd. Go back, listen to that after this one. But it, it's just a, there's a lot to do. You can, it's going to be, it would be health a plan, obviously, but like everything this year has been health plan. So you get these kids together essentially in a small tournament of, I think Will, Will and I said four teams, you, you play them like Memorial cup style tournament and you, and you get some, you get seven, seven to 10 games in on these kids that you, you yeah. just necessarily didn't get a chance to see. And I mean, you could still even do that now with the draft being pushed back to July. I, I guess it just depends on how late the OHL season's going. And I think we'll touch on that in a minute, but it's going to be interesting to kind of see just what the hell is going to happen because 
um if they were to do a showcase event it feels like they should have started planning it a couple months ago but <laughs> yeah. uh nonetheless that's that's kind of what the, what's been said lately but let, let's touch on some of the uh the chl stuff because that's been going on lately uh whl uh it's gotten a couple divisions going back up uh the east division just started back up this weekend i watched a few of the games myself uh connor bedard the uh, exceptional status kid that uh, first one whl 15 years old playing for the vagina bats he scored two goals in his debut because that's just what exceptional status kids do because they're really unless really you're good. sean day yeah he, <laughs> there's a miss every once in a while like, that's, that's what it is but <clears throat> one of the things that came out of it that that was kind of hot, hot on on ottawa senators twitter was ridley greg tried to kill a man because he yeah. hit him right at the red line kind of going behind the net uh chasing a puck and he just nailed him right in the back went into the boards um even Sens fans were like ah oh, that's a that's yeah, it's, hard, it's hard to defend that one yeah it was a rough one and that's what Ridley Greg does though this is I think this is the second straight year I think Justin Froese from uh, FC Hockey tweeted that out that in the debut in the first game of the season Ridley Greg was thrown out and given the suspension so eh, the kid's a fun player but he needs to kind of get that shit under control because yeah it, it's getting a little ridiculous but um it's just fun. The WHL's back. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to watch any of the games, but uh, you, anyone caught your eye yet? It mostly j- just been focused on Genther just because he's such a highly touted prospect. And we went most of the season without being able to see him play at an appropriate level of competition. Yeah. And so um, I, his first few games were really, really encouraging uh, upon his return. I, I caught the highlights of Bedard. I, I plan on diving in and watching his entire game later on but he, he's someone to be really excited over for the coming years that as lackluster as the overall 21 21 class might be the next couple of years are, are going to be a lot of fun yeah it, it's going to be really fun in 2022 and, and bedard's 2023 and there's a couple other yep. kids for 2023 that are going to be really fun too so um this is kind of the year that even even with the pandemic the, the draft class was like eh so, so adding the pandemic on top of that, it's kind of been meh, very, very I think that, that was probably class. more fuel for the desire to push the draft too. Like if it yeah. was a, a stellar class, but like, yeah, more to the quality we've seen in the last couple of years, I think maybe there wouldn't have been such a strong desire from GMs to start trying to push it, but it is what it is. Yeah. Cause I, I think even GMs are like, I don't even know what to do with this class. Cause there's, there's such a variance in, um, this is going to tease something, but I'm, I'm kind of working on something for TLN right now where I'm going to be kind of establishing the value of a first round pick. And let me just tell you this, this year's first round pick is not anywhere close to most years, first round picks. It, it's going to be tough. And, and that's including Especially once you get outside the top 12 to 15, yep. I would say. And, and that's just it. Like I also kind of looked at the value of a top 10 pick this year and within that, and that's even significantly lower than most years. And like, you're looking at a, a pick that, if you're in the top 10, you're getting a pick value to in the twenties, even maybe. So, and, and that's including a, an inflated score for Genther who through four games has 10 points. So you expect that to come down a little bit and his, his essentially a PHL PNHLE, which is one of the stats I'm using to kind of judge things is, is super inflated right now. It's higher than Byfield or Lafreniere from last year. And that still isn't enough to even boost just the top 10 to close to the level of the last couple of years. So it's going to be interesting to see how this draft goes down, but um, thankfully the QMJHL has kind of started back up out in New Brunswick. So we're getting to see those kids a little bit more. Uh, that's a, out in your neck a little, bit, a little bit more. So how have things been going out there? Well, it's just nice to see those guys finally back playing. I think it was like the end of November yeah. since th- those New Brunswick teams were out on the ice. So uh, th- th- there's a lot of draft eligibles. There's a few on the sea dogs. They've got uh, Peter Reynolds uh, is a guy, uh, Josh Roy, he was there, but not there anymore. Yeah, he's gone now. Um, yeah, I think just speaking to the same thing as getting the WHL back, it's almost the same with the Q because they've most of those teams have been off for so long that so much can change in that amount of time when we're talking about kids who are 17 and 18 years old. that You see the kind of development that can take place from one offseason to the next. I think when these kids are missing out on game action for – months at a time you can kind of see though that the same kind of changes when they come back so it's just i'm excited to kind of get more viewings on these guys now that they're back playing and kind of get a better handle on what we can expect from them going into the draft yeah i think that's true for a lot of the kids out in the queue because they're like 
the, the every division has been up and down over there. Every province has been up and down, especially because they have all the teams out in the Maritimes and Quebec and Quebec's been doing bubbles and stuff like that. So it, it's been interesting watching these teams go up and down and seeing how these kids come back for the three or four game stretches that they come back for before they <laughs> shut down again. So um, you, you look at a guy like Zachary Bullduck or Isaac Bellevue and, and both those guys have had really nice flashes recently, but like you have some track record that shows that that's not exactly where they were a few months ago, but you have that big gap and you're like, I don't know if there was true development there or they're just on a hot streak when they come back. So it's going to be interesting to track those guys, especially um, the cues. It's a fun league. It's a, it's a defense free yeah. league. And, and it's, you're going to see a lot of scoring, especially with a year like this, where things are kind of amped down. And, and we've seen that Halifax has gone out and put up 11. I think uh, Moncton got nine put up on yeah. them yesterday or the day before. Well, so. we, we've also seen some of the, the Q league teams kind of sell the farm a little yeah. early this year like the cape breton who gave up 11 yeah. to halifax the other night, they kind of they gutted their their roster pretty good when things were shut down a, a few weeks back and i mean it's hard to blame them you yeah. don't even know if you're going to be able to play out your season if you've got guys that you can kind of exchange for future assets it's, it's not a bad plan but yeah yeah, I don't think it, it's going to be an interesting year in the queue. It, it, I mean, I say that and it's going to be you could replace the queue with any league in the world, really. Yeah. Like it's, it's just that kind of year. Um, but I, I didn't put this in the notes, but I want to quickly touch on it. The OHL is kind of rumored to be talking about coming back. They, they touched on the fact that uh, early April could be a target date. Uh, Lisa McLeod, the Ontario health minister, who said originally that OHL couldn't come back with it with physical body contact, which is ridiculous um is now kind of eased up on that she she mentioned the fact that yeah they can come back soon and they'll be able to use body contact and the fact that she mentioned that was a good sign because i don't think anyone wanted to see the ohl start up with no body checking because not it it's not even the fact that I, like I, i've said this before like i'm not the hugest fighter guy i'm not the biggest body checking guy um when when it's done with a purpose i love it physicality with a purpose is my thing i love that stuff Zachary LaRue does that a lot. I'm a big fan of his game at, at times when he's not kill, trying to murder people as well. <laughs> um, so it's one of those things where I'm like, physicality is necessary in the game. And yes, the fact that you're going to have these kids playing without body checking, or you were going to have these kids playing without body checking, and then next year they go up and they're used to being able to cut across the middle because no one's about, about to cut them off. Well, next year you're going to have a huge 25 or 20 year old guy in the AHL cut you off. And He's not going to really stop you or not going to really hold up on you because he's going to try to go through you to make a name for himself. So I, playing without body checking for a year could have really been detrimental. I'm really glad they decided not to do that. Um, but hopefully we can get the, the OHL going because that's the last league really that we haven't seen. And um, I, I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with pushing the draft back is it's hard to justify pushing the draft back when it's one league. It, it yes. would have been much easier if the WHL wasn't starting up and the QMJHL shut down after November completely and then you have three big leagues, three big feeder leagues going down. And, or if you had a, a couple of the European leagues never even play or something like that, then, then you have those things. But if we're looking at this from a, from a non-biased perspective, if this was the SM Liga that wasn't playing, we wouldn't really be talking about moving the draft back, let's be honest, despite the fact that there's just as many good players in, in the SM Liga as there's the, OM, or the OHL, to be honest. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what the OHL does because, I mean, hopefully they can get up and going. Yeah, well, to your point about the, the body contact thing, like you always hear coaches talk about developing good habits or developing bad habits. And a year playing without any body contact would have just, I think it would have been more harm than good to these kids, honestly. Yeah, it really would. And, and like I said, it, you set yourself up for, for those bad habits of, like I yeah. said, cutting across the middle or coming out from behind the net. And that defenseman's not allowed to hit you this year, but next year he's going to take your head off. And it's just, like I said, it, was, it would have been a bad idea. It didn't make any sense either. Like, you think about all the risks involved with transmission of the virus or what, what have you, the, the concerns that whatever you may have. Like, those guys are sitting next to each other on the bench all night long. They're, like, lined up. Whether you're flying into a guy to smoke him as hard as you can at top speed or not, you're, like, you're still involved in scrumming alongside guys all game long. It just it, it was so silly, in my opinion. Well, that was the thing, right? Like, it's like when you go and you hit a guy, you're in there for three seconds, maybe at the most. That's if you get tangled up, kind of thing. But yeah. when you're battling in the corner or battling in front of the net, you're you're on a guy for ten <laughs> seconds. Like, it's yeah. just what it is. Like, it doesn't make sense to try to eliminate body contact unless you're saying 
literally any body contact cannot happen. And, and then you're just playing a completely different sport and, and it's not exactly. worth it. Yep. I figured I'd jump in here real quick just to give a shout out to Instat Hockey. They've been helping us all year long. We've been lucky enough to partner with them to help scout and evaluate players from all over the world in a year that's not really the easiest thing to do. So Instat is, as everyone kind of knows by now, is one of the best platforms out there. They've got a wealth of player data, team data, and incredibly database of video. They're the elite of the elite when it comes to aiding in player development, scouting, and analysis. For any team or organization looking for help, looking for a way to get an edge, Instat Hockey is the way to do that. And if if you can think you or your organization can use it, definitely reach out to Instat because they're always looking to add people to their team too. All right, let's get into the main topic of today's show. Let's go Tony versus the team. Uh, this is where you get to question my choices essentially on, on some of the guys that I, I was a little bit different on the team with. And we've got a list of some of the biggest differences and some of the just more intriguing differences. So uh, take it away, Nick. Where do you want to start? Well, I think we should start right at the top because everyone knows how big of a Fabian LaSalle supporter you are. I, I'm a very big fan of his game as well. Um, but we did manage to push him down a little farther on the, the team's list than the number one spot that you had him at on your list. So I just kind of like to get your thoughts on that. Um, do you do you support the team's stance or at least understand it at all in comparison to where you are at on Lysel? Well, I want to first put out there that I think the entire team is stupid and they're completely <laughs> wrong. And no, no, of course, like the team, the team did a really good job and that was fun. And, and I did ease off on a lot of my own guys because I, I was releasing my own list. Right. So I, I was letting the team kind of speak for themselves and, and, and really get their guys in there. I helped with kind of winning arguments kind of thing, but I tried not to do too much in, ge- in general, to be completely honest. And, and with Fabian Lucell, I, I think the same three that we had at the top of the board on, on the team's list was the same three at the top of the board on mine. And it was like, you'd get me on a different day and I probably could have chosen William Mecklen or Matthew Beneers. And as I've been kind of doing more film work and stuff, like they've those three have kind of just, even this week have jumped around on, on that top three for me. So um, with Fabian Lucelle though, I think he's the guy with the highest upside. And, and I think that's part of what made me kind of choose him is because I do value that upside really, really high. And, and the fact that he isn't one of these upside guys that you have to worry about his motor. Like he's not one yeah. of these upside guys where you have to worry about, is he going to play well defensively? Because for the concerns that people seem to have when, when he was playing in the Fralenda system, since he's been with Lulio, he's been fantastic. He's been a monster defensively, just kind of stopping everything transition wise. And even in, in, in zone defense, he's been a hound on the puck. So he's a guy that I look at and I'm like, man, like it's similar to Lucas Raymond last year where like, yes, the production's not there right now, but you watch his game and you see so many things he's doing well, whether it's passing the puck to the slot or getting himself to the middle of the ice. It's, it's really encouraging, but you, you do see a little bit more projectability with, with William Mecklen's game. And Matthew Beneers is probably the safe guy to those three. So uh, we had Matthew Beneers at number one with the team's list. Even that day, I was like, no, yeah, 100%, I get this. Like So and any one of those three guys probably would have been my choice. But uh, what was kind of the team's reasoning for, for Matthew Beneers going number one, Nick? I think with Beneers, uh, like I stated during the meeting, I think when you – when you look at weighing a player's floor versus their, their ceiling, I don't think that there's anyone in the draft that kind of strikes that balance better than Beneers. He, he, you don't have to squint very hard to, to see what is going to make him effective as an NHLer. In contrast to maybe LaSalle, where he's not getting the, the same kind of role that mm-hmm. we're seeing Beneers or Eklund get with their respective teams. So maybe you do have to squint a little harder to – project what LaSalle is going to be but I wonder how much more of a conversation it would be even I, I think our group probably has LaSalle higher than than most other public yeah. outlets so I wonder how that would be affected if LaSalle was getting the same kind of role that a guy like Eklund is getting with his team um, yeah yeah I look at it and I go all right with those three sp- players specifically Matthew Beneers is probably the safe guy of that group. He, he's the one, like you said, balances the, the upside and the floor really, really well. And, and, and you look at that and you go, okay, like that's almost a no brainer. Like you you know, you're not going to make a bad pick if you take him. Yeah. Um, William Eck, or, and then Fabian LaSalle on the other hand, like you said, is, is kind of the opposite of that. He's a lot of projection. Like you said, you have to squint to see it. You really have to actually watch his games. And that's what yeah. a lot of people don't do. Let's be honest. And especially with European players, they don't watch the games all that consistently. So 
it's one of those things where you have to squint. Like we said, with Lucas Raymond last year, you had to squint to see what was there. And, and now you look at him this year and he's fantastic. So I don't think anyone thinks Detroit made a bad pick there. Um, and then with William Eklund, I feel like he's the guy that kind of balances both those two things. And, and the fact that he does have kind of that projectable safeness to his game that Veneers does, but not to- quite to the same extent. And he does have that upside flash that, that Lysel has as well. But again, maybe not to the same flashy extent as Lysel. So I, I think one, two, and three with those guys, you, we kind of ranked them uh, Beneers, Eklund, uh, Lysel on the, on the team's rankings. And if I'm not mistaken, it was the exact opposite on mine. So I think <laughs> that's more than, more than just kind of uh, y- you look at it and you go, okay, that's just kind of what Tony values. And, 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 and oh man, I'm talking like Mike Babcock in the third person. <laughs> oh, that well, was not I- cool. I think that, well, I'll save you from that a little bit. I I think um, like those top three have pretty well established themselves, at least amongst our group as kind of a cut above the rest. And I I don't think you can really go wrong with any of those three. If you're, if you're picking in those spots. Yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty well put. So let's move on to the next guy. Where where are we going next? Okay. So the next guy we've got on this list, uh, there's a pretty big difference between, uh, our ranking and yours of Dmitry Katalevsky. Um, you didn't have him ranked at all. And the, the group had him at 55. So that's a, a pretty large discrepancy. And so let's hear about uh, your thoughts on Katalevsky. Well, the first thing I'll say is, you know how I told you the team was wrong? No, no, no. That's me this time. Um, <laughs> he, Dmitry Katalevsky is a guy that I, I think I saw once maybe before we did, uh, I did my rankings. And as we're kind of getting the team's rankings somewhat situated, uh, a little bit behind the scenes stuff here, but uh, we have a, a Google sheet put together and, and whatnot. And I had everyone put in ranges for the guys that are in the regions. And, and that's how we kind of started organizing the, the list for who we were going to talk about and stuff. And, and Dylan Griffin, our Russian scout, who I love so much. Oh, he um, loves you. Oh, we're <laughs> the best friends. Um, but he, he had him uh, in the 40 to 60 range. And I went, oh, that's really high for that guy. So immediately, of course, like my instinct was, all right, let's go check him out. And I went and checked him out. And like, there was just so much there that I missed. Like, and, and that's just a, a miss of not seeing him enough, to be completely honest, on my end. And um, maybe I don't have him at 55 as high as the team had him, but I definitely have him probably just outside the 60 range. And I mean, this kid's really good defensively. He's, he's smart to a player. The offense is, is hit and miss at times. Like that's, that's the big thing with him is there, there've been plenty of times where I'm like, all right, you, you're doing everything. Well, you're doing transition. Well, you're playing excellent defense. You're getting the puck back for your team, you get in the offensive zone and, and you just don't know what you're doing essentially there yet. So um, there's some offensive development with his game, but you see all the skills that would lead you to believe, all right, there's something here. Like he's a player at some point. And especially in a draft like this, where, like we kind of talked about with Beneers and Lysel and Eklund is you got to look at that projectability and the, the ability to say, okay, is this guy going to be an NHL player? Where's his floor? Where's his ceiling? And, and with Katalevsky, I think there's a pretty high floor. Like I think you're, you're going to get a guy that's going to be in, a, in your bottom six uh, or a top six AHL guy. And, and I think you're pretty good at, in the second round at that point, because especially late second round, early third round, in a draft like this, you're not getting a, a huge value player most likely. And unless you're swinging for upside, which, I, again, I argue you do almost every time. So Katalevsky is a guy that I think you draft and you go, okay, that's a safe pick. I know that's a good pick. And, and if you have two second, second round picks or two third round picks and you get Katalevsky with one, then that's when you take that massive swing with the second pick. And I think, and um, you're going to get an NHL player probably there. I think he's a, like I said, good two way defensive player. The offensive game still has to work himself out, but he's, he's definitely a guy that just, I straight up missed on my rankings and, and Dylan kind of pointed out to me after the fact. And, if I, if I would have went back, he would have at least been in my honorable mentions, which I think there were about 25 of them on my list as it was. So um, he's definitely an interesting guy that I think should be on my list uh, next time I, I do my rankings. Yeah, well, that's why we have the group, right? Like it's yeah. impossible for each individual on this team to get multiple viewings on hundreds of players. Um, I, I think that uh, our colleague Sammy kind of put it well during the, the rankings meeting. Once you get to this point in the draft, you're, you're kind of looking for one tool or one specific aspect of a player's game that you could project to the NHL level, that you could see them making a career out of that. And with Katalevsky, like you said, I think the, the responsible game that he plays and just kind of that two-way style, the, the ability to like just kind of hound pucks and 
do the right things that, that will help his team pr- drive play or produce offense. Yeah. Even if he's not doing it individually, I think that's something that you can, can project to the next level. So let's move on to down the list here a little bit. Uh, th- this guy was a bit divisive when we were, we were talking <laughs> about him. He came up multiple times um, during the, the meeting. I, I think he was, there was attempts to place him a little bit higher a, a few times than where he ended up going on the list. And that's Anton Olsen, the Swedish defenseman. Uh, he ended up at 66 on the uh, group's list and he was not rated on your list uh, at all. So well, let's talk about Olsen for a second. He's, he's kind of there. If you squint real hard, like we were saying before that there's, there's something there to, to intrigue, but has he been able to put it together consistently enough? And I think that's the issue is when you watch him play at the junior level, he's almost good offensively and, and you, you see what could be there and his defensive game is his calling card. So like, I'll, I'll get on that right away. And he's a guy that's a, it's stout. He he's known for being able to stop cycles and kind of get the puck to his teammates and, and move it up ice. And, and I think that's a very valid thing. And um, I, I'm, I'm short guy, skill guy. Like that's, that's my stuff. Like short King Nils is my thing. Um, like I, I want a skill, small skill guys. And Anton Olsen is definitely not that he is a, a bigger rough and tumble stout defender who doesn't have a whole lot offensively. And then when you watch him at the SHL level and in the upper levels of Swedish hockey, you go, okay. Like those, those moments where he was almost good offensively are completely gone now. Yeah. Um, and, and that's my main concern. Like uh, I, I think, like you said in the group we were talking and he was pretty divisive like there were a few people that were like i I don't know if we should even rank him and a few people were like well there is like a lot of things that nhl teams really like about this guy and like you could see him getting to the nhl just on the fact that nhl teams seem to love those guys that are stout defensively and don't do a whole lot and and they like putting that guy as their sixth defenseman and we've seen it be successful in other places so maybe he does work out um he's just one of those guys that this year like i look at and i go he's not someone I would draft personally. Um, I've seen him a bunch. And, and I think that's what it came down to, especially this year on my list. I've tried to be a little bit more um, authentic to myself because in, in the past, like you do get talked up by other people and other scouts and other analysts and stuff. And you get talked of, oh, the so player X is, is really good. You should probably rank him a few spots higher. And then you end up doing it or, or player X is, is really bad. And you should rank them a few spots lower. And in every year you kind of get into that. And I always go back to the more outsider example where I had him at seven on my rankings. And then I consulted a few people in 2019 and, and a few respected people and people I still talk to now. And obviously like I didn't disregard them because of this, but <laughs> they, they talked me out of being in my top 10 and he ended up being 11 on my final board and he got picked by Detroit and at sixth and everyone was kind of shocked. Good. <laughs> yeah. Everyone was kind of shocked. And I was, even I was shocked. I didn't think he would go that high. Like I knew I was being completely bold by putting him at seven and I put him at 11 at the end of the year and I go, okay, like whatever. But when he was drafted, I was like, oh yeah, like that's vindication for me. Like it, everyone knows that I'm right, but no one knew I was right because of course I didn't <laughs> release that ranking. Right. Like that's the yeah. thing, but it, it's one of those things I look back on and I go, man, if I would have just been honest with myself, um, I would have looked a lot better in that light. And I've been the more outsider guy. I was st- even at 11. I was still, I think the highest person on him, maybe the second highest person on, on Colin Cudmore's uh, draft ranking tra- tracking. So it was one of those things where I still feel like I, I was right on, on more at Cider. And, and sometimes you just got to trust your gut. And kind of the opposite happened with Anton Olsen, where early in the year, like a lot of people had him at the end of the first round, early second round. And I, I've, every time I've watched him, I go, I just don't like it. And, and it, like I said, it's not that there's not talent there. Like he's just not my style of player or someone I would look at drafting. But you know 100%, like even 66, that's probably low where he is on NHL draft teams ranking. So he's a guy that, I don't know. Like I, I don't mind not ranking him on my list and still rank him on the team list because that kind of shows that there are people that like him. There is value in his game. And, and that's kind of where I came at with him because like I said, just trying to be authentic to myself is what kind of left him off my list. Well, it, kind of to your point about like, you know, consulting with other scouts or analysts that you trust, that's something that we all have to rely on. You, yeah. you have to, you have to figure out which opinions you value and who you trust to to make these assessments of these players because again it's impossible for us to keep tabs all year long and watch every game of every single one of these players and and 
anyone who watches hockey knows that these performances can fluctuate from <laughs> game to game or week to week, let alone month to month when we're talking about kids this age. Yeah. Um, Olsen for me is kind of a guy, I feel like I've been sort of chasing the dragon with him. Like every time I watch him, I like bump him a little farther down my list. Yeah. And I'm like, keep going back and watching, waiting for that game that, I can go, oh, that's why people have him that high. And I don't know, like you said, he's probably someone that's a bit higher on some NHL teams boards because of that stout defense, like maybe that more refined defensive yeah. mind. But I still think that he's struggled to put that together physically, like it, getting his, his, his body to do what his mind knows he has to do. Yeah. So I, I think there's still some some upside there as a, you know, a bottom pairing defender who can kind of move the puck a little bit. But like you said, the, the offensive game has been non-existent at the pro level. Uh, oftentimes he's, he's spending the majority of his shifts defending. So I guess, yeah. is he a, a stout defender or are we just watching him do it all the time? <laughs> so that's fair. Um, let's move on to the next name on the list here. And it's kind of a good segue uh, with you talking about staying true to yourself because this guy was one of the really, really polarizing names, I guess in all draft circles and specifically ours. Um, Bolduc is a guy that I, I wrestle with a lot. We're talking about uh, Zachary Bolduc now. Uh, he came in at 34 on the group's list and was an honorable mention on yours. Um, with Bolduc, there's times that I watch him and I could be convinced to take him 10th overall. And there, there's other times that you see him and, and Braden alluded to this a lot, like the consistency issue, you start questioning what does the consistency issue stem from? Yeah. Is it like his process or is it just a maturity thing? Um, but he, he's a guy that does so many things that you could see being effective at the NHL level. Like the, the way that he, his combination of size, he's not massive, but he's got good size. He skates really well. I love watching him skate. Like he's got such a technically sound stride. His posture is good. He's got his head up when he carries the puck, like scanning everything in front of him. I really like his transition game both ways. He, he's like, like he back check or back checks and tracks really well comes through the neutral zone loves like getting that inside position and just kind of like sneakily lifting sticks he's got a good shot there's just if if you catch zach bull duke on his best night you could go holy shit like this guy is is an elite elite prospect but there's other times it just leaves you wanting more and i wonder if it's more pronounced because of what he's sh shown he's capable of at other times. So I'd like to get your thoughts on Bull Duke because he, he was one that some of the group was a little more bullish on and he didn't crack your top 64. So let's hear about that. I, I think Bull Duke is a guy that is going to be permanently in my honorable mentions all year, whether I do a top 10 list or I do a top 100 list because like he deserves to be in the honorable mention for both of those lists. I think, because <laughs> like you said, there, there are times where you look at him and you're like, man, like this kid is the best player from the queue this year. Like I, I don't see like Zach will do get his best is easily the best player in the queue uh, oh, yeah. like, it, it, from the draft eligibles. At least like you look at him, him at his best compared to Zachary LaRue or Zach Dean or, or Xavier Bargo. And you go, all right, Bull Duke is the guy I think I want. If you're looking at all of their best games, but you look at all of their worst games and you're like, Zachary Bull Duke may not get drafted because there, there are so many holes in his game in terms of, I, I, I hesitate to call it processing speed because you watch him play on his best nights and that processing speed is perfectly fine. You see him scan the ice and make the exact pass you need him to make. It really is a, a really confusing consistency thing with him because man, like the skill is there. Like he was a top pick in the QMJHL for a reason. Like he's, he's a very, very skilled pick or skilled player. And, when, he, when he's able to kind of play his game and, and play up to speed and, and use his teammates well, I think there's a lot of good there. But there's so many times where, like uh, uh, yesterday I was watching a game of his and he was kind of skating up the ice. He was on the breakout. He was at his own blue line. And there's three clear passing options, one right up the wall, one right to the center ice, kind of cross ice, and one right along the blue line that was just an easy outlet pass. And all three lanes were open. There wasn't anybody in all, any lanes. And he just rifled it down the ice for no reason to nobody for an icing. And I'm like, 
dude, you had three options. And then like the a different game I was watching, he makes that pass and then kind of does a give and go, gets by a defender, and then he's in on a breakaway. And it was the exact same play. And it's like, you need to do that more often. You need to think offensively more often. I don't know if that's a coaching thing or or maybe he's just getting tired at the end of shifts and making mistakes there. And that's when we're noticing it. But th- there's something there with Zachary Bolduc that's not letting him be consistent. And I mean, this year isn't the year to really try to hope for a player to gain consistency because even their playing time isn't consistent. So yeah. I think he's the guy that in it, like I- I've been pretty on-, on board with saying the pandemic hasn't really hurt guys in-, in overall kind of views of things outside of the guys who haven't played. That's, that's obviously not fair to them, but um, but the guys that have played, I think for the most part, I don't think it's hurt, hurt players in, in general. Like you look at the national team under development team. Um, you look at some of the guys in the WHL that are getting going now, um, even the European leagues where they've kind of gone up and down in Finland and Sweden. And you're like, okay, well, we, we've been able to see 25, 30 games of these guys. And we've been able to see what they've been able to do on a somewhat consistent basis. Whereas with, with Zachary Bull Duke, I think he needed the, I think he needed 30 games in 45 days or something or like he needed that, that consistent stretch of play to work out those kinks and he hasn't gotten it yet. So like I said, he's going to be on my honorable mentions list all year. Like if I do a top 100, he'll likely be on that list, but it's one of those things where I'm like, man, like the consistency is there. Like you could convince me to take him over a guy that's in the second round. Like we're going to come up on him later, but like you could easily convince me to take him over uh, Andre Gasso or even Billy Coivin and like, it wouldn't be a, a stretch for me to take them there, but that's the guy that, like I said, if you draft Katalevsky in the second round and, and or you draft Zachary Bolduc at the start of the second round, you, you draft Katalevsky after that to kind of mitigate the risk there a little bit. And it's going to be an interesting thing with Bolduc because I, I've talked to some people who have him top 15, top like close to the top 10. And then I've talked to others who are like, uh, like NHL scouts, even that are like, I don't know. Cause like the, the consistency is a real issue. And, and, I think that's what it came down to me because I couldn't justify not having him on the honorable mentions list. I did a top 64 and like I could put him realistically anywhere after 50. So it's, it's an interesting player and the consistency is just, I think that's the thing that kills it for me. It's almost like when he's playing, he's got like some song that's playing in his head and there's times where it's a song he really likes and he's more into that and more distracted by that. Or, and he just kind of drifts around out there aimlessly sometimes. <laughs> but once he gets it going, he's a really intriguing player with, with the, the raw skill set that he has. He's going to be an interesting one to watch on draft day, I think. Um, yeah, I think that was a really good kind of like uh, comparison though, right? Like anyone that's ever gone to the gym and tossed headphones on, everyone knows like when your song hits, like that's when you're going, like that's when you're going to have your best workout. But like you get that one Cheryl Crow song that just happened to sneak onto your list or whatever. And you're like, all right, this is a cardio song. Like this isn't, this isn't something I'm, I'm getting li- ways lifting to. And maybe that's his issue, right? Like there, there's just something that needs to fl- switch in his head. But like you said, let's, let's move on to the next guy. All right, so next we've got uh, Billy Coivin in the Finnish winger. Uh, the, the team had him at 61. Um, this is the first time that we're, we're breaking into the, the portion of the show where the team was lower on some of these guys than you were. So you had Coivin in at 55. Uh, not, not a big jump from where the, the team had him, but let's hear your justification on that. Yeah, I added Coivin into the list despite the fact that there is only a six-position difference. And, and I, I think it's because if it weren't for me, I think E2 would have had Koivin in like in the seventies or eighties. Because E2 hates all the people from his country. Every single Finn is just the worst <laughs> in, in his view. <laughs> but like, no, it's one of those things where I think Koivin in like, we talked about a little bit before the podcast where I think Koivin is a guy that you, you, you notice him a lot more because of Samu Tuomala because he plays on his line a lot of times. And, and Tuomala has that wicked shot that finishes, but there's so many times where I watch those two and I'm like, okay, like Tuomala is the guy that gets credit here. He had that wicked shot from the circle or wherever it was, but Koivinen was the one that did everything on that play. He was the one that got the puck in the corner and kind of worked his way out. And he isn't a huge guy by any means, but he's slippery. He's, he's got a lot of skill. He needs to work on his strength. Definitely. Like anytime he's played against anyone older than him, there, there's a clear strength issue, but he, I think he's 5'10 or 5'11, uh, 170. So it's not like he's got a non-projectable frame by any means. He's not, Marcus Almquist, who is five eight and on five generous four. day, yeah, <laughs> realistically five four, but so he's not small by any means, but he's not big either. So you look at him and you go, okay, where does this skill project? If you put him on a line with a guy like 
Patrick Laine or, or a guy like uh, Alex Debrinkat. Like uh, th- those are just two guys that I think of because those are guys that aren't necessarily the guy that's going to go into that corner. They're not going to be the guy that battles it out and gets the puck or, or makes the, the skill play to get the goal score at the setup. So I, I think Koivinen is going to be a guy that I don't think he'll ever get his, his due to be completely honest. He's going to be a guy that even if he does make it to the NHL, he's playing on a second or third line and he's that primary setup guy. Like I, I wouldn't be shocked to see him kind of not get any credit despite the fact that, Hey, look at that. He put up a 50 point season, but the guy he was on line with had 70 or, or the guy he's on line with had 60 and he had 40 or something like that. Like he's just going to be that guy. That's a really good support player. Um, I, I think there, there's a lot to like about his, the fact that he can be that complimentary guy and he doesn't need to be the guy that's on that line. And over the last couple of years, I've tried to justify, like not justify, but I've tried to kind of bring that into my mindset. Like every player I look at, especially my first couple of years of doing this, I was like, all right, like if this guy's the star, what's he going to do? And, and that's kind of not the best way to look at it because not everyone's going to be the star, right? Like if you, you end up wind up on a line with Austin Matthews, I don't care who you are, unless you're Connor McDavid, you're not the best player on that line. Um, so these kids are going to be in that situation as they move up levels. And, and I think Coyvin is a guy that's already shown the ability to adapt to that. And it's not like he's like working off of the star only. Like he's able to pr- to create plays for himself and his other teammates when he's away from Tuomala and stuff. So I think that's really valuable. He's a guy that I, I think Xavier Borgo is a lot like that as well, where if he's the best player on your line, it's probably not the best line, but if he's the second or third best player on that line, it's probably a pretty good line because he's able to do a lot. That's kind of able to complement off the other players that, that are on the line with him. So I think Koivin is kind of like a poor man's version of that. Obviously not the same skill set, but the same kind of role I see playing is like that second or third best guy on the line that, just kind of does a lot of good things for his teammates around him. Yeah, well, we often talk about, you know, projecting the skill sets of these players. But to your point, sometimes it's about projecting the proper role for them, right? Yeah. So if you take a player like Koivin, you, you have to put him in a position to be successful. He's not going to stand out if he's digging pucks out for guys that, that can't finish or setting guys up in the slot that can't even corral the pass, let alone get a shot yeah. off and score, right? So Koivinen's a player that I haven't really seen a whole ton of. So he's someone that I'll, I'll definitely defer to you on. But I I think projecting the role is something that's important too, when you're talking about these players and and just kind of visualizing where they might fit into an NHL group and what kind of talent you'll have to surround them with to get the best out of them. So I think if you can, if you can bring Koivinen into your organization and put them in that kind of position with some finishing talent. You might have a player there. Um, let's move on to this is a guy that I, I really like. You, you kind of instructed me to, to go have a look at him a few weeks back. And he's someone I've, I've watched a couple more times since then. Andre Gasso for the USNTDP, the, the U18 squad. The, the group had him at 72. He's someone I would have liked to get up there a little higher, probably closer to, to where you had him, or maybe even a little bit higher than that just because of – the, the the toolkit that's there um we had him at, at 72 and you've got him at 62 so let's hear your thoughts on Andre Gasso he's a guy that doesn't get the spotlight he he just yeah he's a guy that I think on the national team development team I, like I love that team I watch them all the time I don't think I've missed a game this year um it, it's one of those things where like they they play their favorite they they do they they have their guys that from the time they make that U17 squad, they're top six guys for the next two years. And that, that's just how it is. Um, and, and that's nothing against those guys. Usually they're, they're well-deserving of it. Like a guy like Chaz Lucius, like he's certainly deserving of being a top six guy on that team. But I think Andre Gasso has been a guy that when he's gotten the opportunity in the top six, you've seen him produce, you've seen him do what you want a top six player to do. But so many times they put him on that fourth line, they put him on the third line. And he, it's because he's super versatile. He's played on both yeah. wings. He's played at center. Um, he's huge. I think he's six foot four, 200 pounds. Um, he's just a really projectable player. Like I look at him and I go, he's probably going to be a guy that plays in your bottom six, just does a lot of responsible things. Like I almost look like I, I see a lot of Brian Boyle in him and like th- just the ability to do the right thing at the right time, whether it's make, make just about any pass or, or get a good shot off. Like he isn't great at anything. Like that's, that's one thing about him that is kind of a knock, but he is really good at a lot of things. And, and I think that goes the long way at the, at the next level. So I, I think he's a guy that like, like you said, right. If you put him a little bit higher than what I even had him in, in the fifties and stuff, I, I don't think that's a bad pick because like we said earlier, like you got to balance that 
ability to get to the league and the ability to do stuff in the league. And he's a guy that I think really strikes that balance in the second round and, and or late second round, early third round, where you could get him and, and put, like I said, a couple of years from now, after a couple of years in college, you put him on in your top bottom six and you go, all right, you just know that spot's going to be reliable. And I think that's yeah. what I like about his game is just, he's just really reliable at both ends. Um, like I said, he can make just about any pass that you need him to make. He's not going to be the flashy guy. He, like, don't expect him to pull off a Mitch Marner type move or something like that, or or get a shot off like Chaz Lucius does in, in, on his own team. But he's going to be able to get to the slot. He's going to be able to get behind the net. He's going to be able to kind of work with himself along the ball, boards. The thing I, I've really liked about him is, despite the fact that he's six foot four, he's not a guy that goes in to blow up on hits. Like he's a guy that goes into the boards, establishes body position, and just wins the battle. Yes. Um, that's that's a big problem I've had with a couple of the national team program players over the last couple of years that are the bigger guys is they like to throw their weight around and that team loves to do it when they have a bigger player and they instruct them to do it when they have a bigger player. But a lot of times that was throwing guys out of position. Like I, I look back at Tyler Clevin last year and like, we look at all the highlight hits that he had and like, they were fun to watch. Like, don't get me wrong. Like you watch those hits and you're like, man, he just blew that guy up. Like in most of the time they were clean too. So it wasn't like an issue of he was being a dirty player by any means, but after that hit you see the puck go behind him and you see that it's two a two-on-one on one. yeah, yeah. And, and you're like okay like the hit was cool but like what did it cost you and with yeah. so you don't get that and he he does play forward so um there's a little bit less uh reliance on him defensively but he's responsible he gets to the low slot he gets in front of the net he'll battle out in the corners like he's just a guy that i, I look at and i go well he just does hockey well yeah he's a guy that i think will earn the moniker of, of a coach's dream yeah he, he's like everything you're saying about him is true he's just a guy that you can trust to do the right thing all the time he, he i love his work rate away from the puck he's always hungry to get it back or or just be in the right spot to, to cover that passing lane um one thing with gasso is he's a fine skater yeah uh, for his size and uh, we talked about this before i wonder about the potential for a bit more of like a power element in his game if he could add a bit of that explosiveness, I think they're like, he doesn't stand out as the most offensively skilled player, especially on the, the team that he's playing with. There are so many high level offensive prospects that are getting that bigger ice time, like you said, but with the tools and the brain that he's got and that size and the fact that he's already like got decent mobility for a guy that size, I, I do think there is some upside there as more of like a, a a power forward than just simply a, a reliable two-way guy, but he'll always have those elements as well. So I think that that floor alone makes him a guy that's like worth taking that swing on in the, in, you know, middle second round to, to mid third round, just because you know, you're getting a guy. And like you said, it's, you can basically scratch that spot off in your lineup in the coming years. Once he, he gets there and you know that, You've got that. He could be a, a good third line center. And if he's not, he'll be a good fourth line center or a, a good third line winger. Even the versatility yeah. and the, the work rate, just to, the way he thinks the game, even if his raw skills don't stand out the way that some of the other guys in this range do, you, you've got to look for, for what's going to make a guy an, an impactful NHLer. And I think that Gasso has a lot of those things that coaches and, and scouts will love that are just easy to project to the NHL level. Yeah. So we'll move on to the next guy on this list. This is another guy that I haven't really got to see a whole lot of, and that's Nolan Allen. Uh, the team had him at, at 62 and you had him at 49 on your list. So there's a, a difference of 13 spots. Um, it, just to, Tell me a little bit about Nolan Allen, because I haven't really seen a whole lot of him. I know he's he's more of a kind of a defensive presence than, you know, a pure puck mover or, or anything like that. So give us your thoughts on him. Yeah, Nolan Allen's an interesting one, because up until last night, we hadn't seen him play. And last night, he played his first game in the WHL. And I watched it this morning because I, I just want to make sure I, I wasn't crazy <laughs> when we were doing this. But no, he's he's a really good defensive guy. He, he He's always in position. He just kind of understands angles really well. He understands how to get guys into spots that he can take advantage of them in, whether it's kind of pushing them along to the boards or, or keeping them up at the blue line and really forcing play out, out to the outsides. He's excellent at that. And one of the things I really valued with him last year is while he wasn't kind of the guy that was 
uh, skating the puck up the ice and being that dominant force, he was quick. He was used quick decisions. He was able to make the quick pass and, and understood where to go with the puck. And uh, he just played a lot of mistake free hockey. And I think that's what I liked about him is because I, I look at him in the same light. I look at uh, Braden Schneider from last year and, and Braden Schneider was about in the same range for me. Um, Schneider ended up going in the top 20 though. So um, it, it's going to be interesting to see where Allen goes because he doesn't get that full year. He's a late April birthday. I think he's April 28th. Um, so he's a, a, bit, a bit of a younger player as well, whereas Braden Schneider was an older player. But Allen, he just does a lot of good things with the puck when he has it, and he, he makes a lot of good decisions with it. And I, I think that's something you got to really value when you're looking at a defensive defenseman. I'm not looking for that, like we, we kind of alluded to him earlier, but Tyler Clevin, right, where he's that physical presence and he's he's got that one element and he's really only got that one element. So you have to work like bank on him tracking with that one element whereas i think nolan allen's a got a lot more to his game he's got a lot more versatility he he is a bigger kid he's six foot three so it's not he lacks the size he's a good skater um but he's not an exceptional skater by any means so i i think he's a guy that you you look at him and you project to the nhl and you go what could he kind of be what role would he fit in and i i look at what jake muzzin or tj brody do at the nhl level where they're not the guys that are the the offensive a bit more understated right yeah like they're like we look at jake muzzin and, and if he goes down on the leafs and we go okay like that's a big loss if riley goes down on the leafs we're like okay that's a big loss but would we rather be jake muzzin or would we rather be tj brody because those are the two guys that have kind of stabilized things back there and while you don't want any of your top four to go down if it's your offensive leaning guy you kind of you're okay with it to an extent when they're not really a, a defensive presence at all and that's kind of where morgan riley is in his career Whereas Nolan Allen's the guy that's similar to TJ Brody or Jake Muzzin. And I, I don't want to say that that's who he's going to be because his ceiling is probably those guys, but his floor likely isn't those guys. Right. So he's probably going to end up somewhere around that range, but stylistically that's where he kind of fits in where he's, he's able to kind of make the right play defensively. He, he angles things off. Well, he gets the puck back on his stick and he makes a good pass up to the forward or he makes a good pass to his defensive partner to break, start the breakout. Um, he's not a guy that necessarily needs to be the star of the show, but when you're really watching him and when you've talked, like I've talked to NHL scouts about him as well. And I, I've even talked to a couple of NHL scouts that have him like right in the third, like late thirties and stuff. So he's a guy that as the season kind of goes on with the WHL, if they get their full 24 games in, I think a lot more people are going to be talking about this kid. So uh, 62, I don't think it was a bad spot by any means. I think the second round is probably the range that he want that he should be in. And I, I think, with Joel leaving kind of right before everything and, and whatnot, right. Kudos to him. He, he's going on puck preps and he's doing a lot of good things there and uh, follow puck preps on Twitter uh, for all that stuff. But um, I did, I'll, I'll be, I'll be honest. Like I leaned on Joel right before the meeting too. And I'm like, Hey, I like Nolan Allen. Make sure I'm not crazy. Like what, what, what do you like about him? And he, he kind of echoed the same things, right? He's a really reliable, smart player. And, and I think that, that, plays well at the next level is, is brains and especially when you're as mobile as he is uh, he's got good size and, and he's not afraid to to match up along the boards when he has to but it's not his first choice and I think that's what I really value it sounds like one of those players who you know oftentimes when fans are watching hockey and they kind of you know they have an opinion about a defenseman or a play they made it's always the bad play because it's so visible and the way you're describing Allen, it kind of sounds like one of those defensive players that you really have to, you know, watch very closely to see the things that he's doing that make him effective. But those are things that NHL teams will value, especially if it projects him as a, one of those, you know, sturdy defenders that even if he's not a, a big time puck mover is providing value to your team. So let's get to the next guy on the list. This is a fun one. We talked about him a little bit before jumping on, on the call here. Uh, Dimitri Zugan, uh, the team had him all the way down at 97, just inside our, our top 100. Uh, you had him just inside your top 64 at 63. So tell us a little bit about uh, this little speed demon, uh, Dimitri Zugan. Well, this is a guy that, I, again, I credit Dylan Griffin for, for kind of exposing me to him initially. And it was a couple months ago now. Um, and he's just like, oh, check this guy out, right? Because I just randomly asked, hey, give me a couple prospects to watch. And he was one of the names they threw out. And this kid just goes like his motor is just unstoppable. He's always going with the puck and he's a fun player to watch. And, and I, I'm going to be honest. I value fun. I do like yeah. hockey is entertainment, um, but I, I value projectable fun. And that's what Dimitri Zugan is because 
this kid is a hound on the puck. He's always going all over the place, whether it's the offensive zone or defensive zone, he's going a hundred miles an hour and you're going to need him to rein that back a little bit. Like, but when I look at a player and I'm like, okay, how am I going to affect his effort level? I would much rather be like, all right, Hey, Dimitri, you got to rein that back in a little bit yeah. than going to another guy and being like, Hey dude, like you got to just try on some shifts. Like that's yeah. like in, in with Dimitri Zugan, like the offensive skills are, are a work in progress. He's, he's got some decent hands, but sometimes he gets a little too much going for himself. And I think that's his hands trying to catch up with his feet and everything yeah. like that. And I, I think there's work to do in that regard, but I think this kid's got a lot of potential like this. I, I, every time I watch him, I go, man, this look, uh, looks a lot like Zach Hyman in 2016, 17. Like this looks a lot like a guy that you go, okay, he's a capable player. Like you want him in your, in your top nine, you want him playing decent minutes and, and doing the things that you don't want Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner and William Nylander doing, which is like necessarily digging in the corners, right? Like those guys aren't valuable there. So if you can get a guy that can play with them, like a Zach Hyron, like a Jermichi Zugan, who can do those things and still have the the requisite skill level to get them the puck and make a play. I think that's really valuable. And I I see Jermichi Zugan as a lot like that. And we're seeing it this year with Zach Hyman. And even last year, to an extent, where he's on pace for 30 goals over 82, where he's starting to produce, he's starting to score, he's starting to do things with that skill. Like we've seen Zach Hyman make a couple nice plays where he just deeks the goalie out of his jock like this year. Like I think it's, the it's three been, nicest goals of his career have been in the last two weeks, probably. So. Yeah. Like we're seeing a lot of really nice stuff from Zach Hyman. And obviously like you don't expect a guy approaching 30 to all of a sudden start developing these things. Like Zach Hyman's a, a unicorn in that regard. But if you can get Dimitri Zugan in your system and you go, okay, like maybe a couple years from now, you're, you're a little bit more like maybe you're a top nine guy right now, but you're a top six guy when you're 25, 26. Um, he's a guy that there's a lot of projection to his game. Admittedly, there really is, but this, the skill, the motor, the, the brain is all there. And, and when you have those things and you're just trying to mold a ball of clay, I think that's a lot more valuable than getting a guy that you have to work on improving a lot of those things because with Zugan, you don't need to, you just need to, put the tools in the toolbox because right now they're kind of scattered all over the garage. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think the thing with Zugan, I, I like the comparison to Hyman just because of, I think Zugan maybe has a bit more like pure speed yeah. th that, that pressures defenders and kind of just puts them back on their heels or makes them ha have to rush a decision on a retrieval or something like that. Whereas Hyman is just kind of like even more pure effort yeah. to, to disrupt those kind of things. Uh, but I like that comparison because I, I've only seen a little bit of Zugan, but I, I think he's got a, a pretty decent shot. There is like that requisite skill you're talking about where you can, you can see how he could be a, at least a mildly productive offensive player yeah. at, at the North American pro level. Uh, his speed just really backs guys off. And if, he, if his hands could ever catch up to his feet a little bit, then you're talking about a player on a – a level above Zach Hyman, right? Yeah. So there's a bit of boom bust with Zugan, but at the same time, he's got a relatively safe floor because of the way he's able to impact the game with his speed and that work ethic away from the puck too. So we've got one more guy on this list here. Uh, this is, should we call up Mikhail and get him on for the end of the show here? Oh man. I feel like we almost should, but I'll, I'll vouch for Mikhail. Like I the next guy's William Strong again, and, and that's just he he was a very divisive guy. There was a 51 point or 51 different rank difference in our lists, and we can and, attribute most of that to Mikhail, I think. And we do lean on him because that that's his region for our group, too. Yeah, so. and, and Alexa had some concerns as well, and she does our Swedish scouting as well and stuff. And like everything Mikhail said was true. Like, there's a lot of projectability issues, there's a lot of effort issues, there's a lot of like what were the hell were you doing on that play? William issues. Like he's the guy that I, I would love to get on and talk to because it would be really fun to kind of break down tape with him and just be like, Hey, what were you thinking on this play? Like it, it's, he, he's a really interesting prospect in that regard, but e even Mikhail and Alexa, like they, they've even said it, like there is, there's skill there. There, there is a lot of upside. The, the problem is like, there's a very real risk that he does not play in the NHL ever. And, and he's six foot four. Uh, I think he's almost 200 pounds. Um, he's got great hands. He's got a wicked shot. He doesn't always like trying though. And that's, that's part of the issue. And we just talked about Dimitri Zugan, who was Mr. Tryhard and, and William Stromgen is pretty much the opposite of that. And I think that's the biggest <laughs> issue there. And, and uh, 
uh, we had him at 92 on the rank on the rankings for the team. I have him at 41 and um, I'll, I'll be honest, like even on subsequent viewings, like I, I have bumped him down a little bit. He's still in the top 50 on my rankings on my, on my sheet myself, but he's a guy that, like I said earlier, I really value upside. I, I always look to those guys that you can project into that next spot, right? Like you got to find, figure out what role this kid could play and, and put him in that position to succeed. And I, I think William Strongman is a guy that you could play on your second line as a, as a winger and you play on the power play and he'd be a really good scoring threat. And he, he's got all the skill. He's got all of the tools that you look for. Um, the, the effort is kind of an issue and his skating isn't great. His skating is good. Um, but there are times where he just starts to float. Like, and I think part of the skating issues, a lot of it is his effort. And yeah, I don't like calling out a kid's effort usually, but man, like there, there's a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of times with William where like, you're like, if you took one more stride, you would have been able to get to that loose puck or you would have been able to cut off that pass and, and started a breakaway for yourself. But th- there's, times where you watch William Strongren and you're like, all right, like this isn't a player that I want to watch. And Oh, he just scored two goals. Sweet. Like yeah. he's got the skill and he's got, like I said, he's, he's got a lot of those tools and you just got to figure out what you're going to do with them. Because like, like Mikhail says, right. Like th- there may not be an NHL player here. There may not even be an AHL player here to be completely honest. Yeah. So it's one of those situations. I know, I know you're kind of high on Strongren, not maybe not as high as I am, but I know you like parts of his game as well. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, discussing all that and the difference between where you know yourself or even I have stronger in comparison to, to someone like Mikhail or even Alexa it's kind of a philosophical issue when you get yeah. down to it right is how much do you value that upside versus the the lower probability that he's going to reach it and once you get to you know the middle rounds of the draft I think that you should be should be looking for those home run swings. You know, it, it's easy to, to sign a, a new fourth liner every off season for a league minimum or something like that. Right. That's, that's not really what you should be shooting for in the draft, especially at this point, like you're not worried about getting the security of guaranteeing an NHL player with your third or fourth round pick. So Strongen is a guy, like you said, the, the effort sometimes is just, <laughs> it's very frustrating. It, 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 he seems like kind of a passenger. He's sort of just waiting around for his teammates to do the work. And he's like, I'll be over here once you guys get it, you know, send it over this way. I'll, I'll fire it into the net. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it all comes down to individual team philosophies uh, yeah. um, where this guy's going to end up. Like if you really trust that you can, you can work out those, perceived at least effort issues and and just get him to be kind of more engaged at all times so that he can take better advantage of those raw offensive tools that he's got. Because like you said, the shot is a legitimate weapon. He's got great hands. I I think that he really does have the offensive vision and awareness to, to get it done. But is he going to be able to bring it consistently and just kind of shake that, that reputation that he's starting to develop as kind of a, a low effort player at times. Yeah. I think what you said there about like, it's going to depend on team's philosophy as well on where this guy goes. Like I, he's going to be one of those guys that like every year, there's a few guys on draft boards across teams. And, and of course we never see the draft boards and it's not like teams are like, all right, now the draft's done. So here's our list. Like yeah. we don't get to see that, but every year you hear reports of, of player X's, he was a first round, first rounder on my board, but other teams are like, I wouldn't have drafted him. Like we look yeah. at last year where you were, uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets drafted you were you or Chinnikov and like instantly I, I texted a couple of scouts that I knew <laughs> and I was like, uh, what's going on there? And they're like, no clue, man. Like that even was the wild. draft broadcast yeah. had no clue. They're scrambling to pull up some kind of stat line. For well, my favorite thing about the draft broadcast is like, as soon as Chinnikov was announced, they go, they cut to his, uh, they cut to the panel and the panel was all like looking, <laughs> looking side to side. Like, uh, you know, you know, and, and Craig button, of course, in typical Craig button fashion goes, I know this guy and this is where he is. And, and I've got two sentences on him because I thought he was going in the sixth round. Like, <laughs> like no one knew this was got, I was going that high. And, and I think that applies to every draft and, and that kind of goes with William Stronger. And like, I won't be shocked if he's 
a late first rounder on some boards because there are a lot of people that really like the skill set, really like the shot, really like the ability. And, and the fact that he's six foot four certainly doesn't help hurt him. So he's going to be high on some lists, but there, there's going to be other lists that are like, he's a fourth, fifth rounder maybe. And if he falls, we'll take him. but he's going to get drafted higher than we'll rank him. And I, I think that's kind of where myself and Mikhail have had a bunch of talks about him and we've discussed him a bunch in our DMS and Twitter, and we've even talked about him on calls and stuff. And I think, the big thing is, is like you said, there's that little bit of a philosophical difference. And, and that's why we have the team, right? Like having the team has is, is been great to be able to kind of bounce the ideas off of. And um, William Stromgren was one of those guys that I think has been, like, like I said, with, after talking with Mikhail and, and understanding his point of view and stuff, and, and then in some su- subsequent viewings, like I said, I have bumped him down a few spots on my list already. And it's only a few weeks. So it, it's going to be one of those things where, the more I see him and the more I kind of understand where other people are coming from. And, and, and that's what we got to is earlier when we were talking about, we, you have to consult with scouts and you have to consult with other analysts because you can't see every game of every player. Right. So uh, there, there's been plenty of times where I've talked to Mikhail or talked to you or talked to someone else. And I've been like, Oh, like, I'm not so high on this player or I'm really high on this player. And, and the person comes back and they're like, Oh, we'll watch this game. Right. Cause yeah. th- then you'll see more of where I'm coming from, whether it's good or bad. And I go back and I watch that game and I go, and a lot of times I'm like, oh yeah, you know what? I, I did see what you were talking about, but there have been a few times where I'm like, I, I'm not seeing it. Like, yeah, that, that issue's there, but I, I still don't value the the negative of that issue where I value the positives of, of such and such tool. And, and that's not just with Stromgren. That's been with a bunch of guys. Like uh, I, I mentioned earlier that Dylan Griffin was the one that kind of, uh, introduced me to Dimitri Zugan a couple months ago. And I got, like I said, I'd seen him play a couple times, but it wasn't really anyone that I was really tracking. And then when I focused in on him, now I like him more than Dylan. And I think Dylan, like <laughs> me and Dylan make fun of each other all the time and we joke and stuff. And he's a little bit more serious about his hatred towards me than I am, but it's cool. Whatever. <laughs> but um, no, now we, we debate on Dimitri Zugan. And we're like, man, like I'm a little bit higher on him now because then where Dylan is. And, and we've had discussions about him. So I think that goes without saying like, anytime you have a team that's going to be what it is like none of us look at our like, my favorite thing is that none of us look at our rankings and go that's perfect because it's not yeah. right like especially you know, this year <laughs> oh man oh god our <laughs> this year but it's one of those things where i think when you have a team like you you have to look at the rankings and if no one's perfectly satisfied you did your job and, yeah. and i think that's what we we all kind of look at this list and we all go okay like we did our job and and william Stromgren's, i think the perfect example of that because half of the team wanted to really rank him and, and half the team wanted to be pretty high on him. And I, like I said, I, I had him in my forties and I still have him in my forties, although it's late forties now, but I, I was fighting, like not fighting for him, but I was bringing up his name kind of in the fifties, in the sixties and, and giving that give and take with, with Mikhail, who Mikhail is kind of on the board of like outside of the top 100, probably like he maybe is an honorable mention type thing, right. For our list. But Alexa was kind of in that range of like, yeah, let's, let's rank them late. Right. So you kind of come to that compromise on a team and in, and I think that's a good way to kind of sum up the the comparisons between my rankings and the team's rankings is that while there, they are, there's a few, quite a big differences. Uh, Stromgren's 51, Zugan's 34, you go in the opposite direction and, and you got guys like Dmitry Kedalevsky, who I, I left completely off my list and that kind of ended up being a, a 45 di- point difference. If we're just kind of going on, he'd be 101 but um i'll be honest like he was a guy that i didn't really have on my radar until dylan showed me him after my rankings went out so that'd be different now but anton olsen 34 34 rankings difference like it, it's good to have those differences it's good to have these discussions and um part of the reason i like doing that that meeting and recording it and posting it as a podcast edited down with some of the stuff taken out and stuff <laughs> obviously but um is because when I've talked to people, like that's how NHL scouting meetings are going for the most part, right? Like that's how it's what's going on behind the scenes. And, and when I was kind of first getting into draft stuff, when I was a teenager, yeah, when I was a teenager and I was just following the coverage and stuff, like I would have loved to have that behind the scenes. Look, I would have loved to like understand the process and that's not for everyone. Like no one, like a lot of people don't want to get into the meadow details and stuff of Dimitri Zugan's game. Right. Like, <laughs> like, so it's one of those things where it's that that podcast specifically is for the draft nerds it's for the people that are really diehards about the draft um I, I, there's a few people i've talked to that are like yeah we made it through the first hour where you guys got through the top 15 and i'm like honestly <laughs> that's more than i expected so good job <laughs> like my brother texted me and after i and he listened to it and he goes 
man, I'm about two hours in. Uh, you guys ever going to finish the top 100? And I was just like, <laughs> we, we actually don't know. <laughs> yeah. We didn't. Like, <laughs> that's just it, right? So um, having the team there and having the team to bounce ideas off of, it, it's been a really valuable experience for me personally. And I, I'm assuming for yourself as well. Yeah, I, I love being part of this group and just having so many smart and talented people to bounce ideas off of and, and discuss these players with. And to your point about the coming to that compromise between the individual rankings amongst the group, oftentimes the, the truth lies in the middle. So we'll, I guess we'll see in 10, 12 years when we have a better handle on how all these players turned out in their NHL careers. But I, I think that it's, it, it's an invaluable tool for all of us to, to have each other to, to work these things through with. Yeah, because even if Mikhail and I lose touch over the next 10 years, which I don't hope happens, but if it happens, you know I'm going to be looking his number up in the Swedish phone book just to be like, look at how good William Stromgren is, and he's immediately <laughs> going to hang up on me. Or it'll be the exact opposite where he's calling me and he goes, man, William Stromgren had two goals in the SHL last season in 84 <laughs> games, like some ridiculous number. And like he'll call me and call me out on it. But like, how is that why we all do this? Exactly, you know, you, right? Like old yeah. takes exposed, good or bad. <laughs> oh, it's the best. I love looking back on me saying Connor McMichael has no speed or skill to his game and he probably won't be an NHLer and then immediately be, being proven wrong almost. So that's I thought awesome. Jonathan Dubin was going to be the, the best <laughs> playmaker outside of Sidney Crosby for 15 years. Uh, so, yeah. Oh. Yeah, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I always go back to the Connor McMichael. Like I I said earlier, I always go back to the Mort Sider one to pump me up. And then I always go back to Connor McMichael in the same year to to rip me (laughs) down because boy was I wrong on him. (laughs) um, Yeah, let's get out of here, though. That that was fun. Let's plug some stuff, Nick. Where can people find you? What what work have you got going out recently? Uh, Well, I've been uh, writing about the Leafs at theleafsnation.com for a while now. I'm mostly covering uh, prospects. I do kind of a prospect roundup every Friday over there, just kind of latest news and notes and maybe a couple of highlights on on what some of the the Leafs prospects have accomplished. Uh, And yeah, just been doing a lot of work with the the Dauber team, spending every spare minute watching tape of some kid over in Finland (laughs) or Russia or something like that. And uh, I also co-host a, a, a Leafs podcast with a couple of good friends of mine. It's called Lamenting the Leafs. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, Google, SoundCloud, all that stuff. So uh, if, you, if you're so inclined, check that out. Give us a, a rating or a subscription. And yeah, this is fun. I, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I mean, it was fun. Uh, definitely check out the podcast because I, I like the fact that you guys don't all share the same opinion. Like there, there's so many times on Leaf podcasts where everyone's like, this is the opinion. Yes, 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 yes. And, and there's so many times where you guys kind of get into little debates about different things. And I, and I really, I really enjoy listening to that because th- there's nothing better than controversy, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's what people love. And, and, and well, I appreciate little... you enjoying the show. Yeah. It, it's been fun. And, and like I said, check Nick out on Twitter as, as well at Nick Richard underscore, right? right? At underscore Nick Richard. Oh, I'm terrible. Uh, hey, I didn't even remember to plug my Twitter handle. So don't feel bad. At least I didn't tell people to follow D- at Dylan underscore Griffin again. So do that because that account, account definitely exists. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I, I appreciate everyone listening to the podcast. I appreciate you joining me. Uh, leave a rating or review or whatever on whatever platform you're listening on five stars. It's always appreciated. And if you don't want to leave a review, just leave a ball joke or something. I'll read it on the podcast next weekend. And uh, you'll make Dylan's day. Yeah, exactly. Right. The, the better the ball joke, the better Dylan will have a, a weekend. So uh, get that out there. I'll, I'll read it on the podcast or whatever. And uh, but without further ado, let's get out of here. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, we'll talk soon. Rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using, whether it's Apple, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Dauber Draftcast. You can find Tony at the Tony Ferrari. Thanks for listening.